Greta Thunberg wins Time Magazine's Person of the Year because it's 2019 and we reward temper tantrums over actual bravery and achievements. Jason Kenney goes to Ottawa looking to make a deal. Boris Johnson shows us what it's like to run an effective conservative campaign. The NHL tries to turn locker rooms into college safe spaces. And it's Thursday, so we will do fake news of the week and ask me anything. I'm Candace Malcolm and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Got a lot of news to get to, so let's jump right to it. On Wednesday, Time Magazine named its coveted person of the year, going to none other than Greta, the crazed environmental catastrophist who promotes climate alarmism, climate emergency, climate doom, climate anxiety, everything to just make everyone in the society completely afraid as if the world is going to end if we don't take on very drastic measures. As you know, Greta is a zealot. She's very ideological, very authoritarian. And what she believes, if we actually implemented it, would be the end of modern technology, it would be the end of the comforts and the standard of living that we enjoy. It would push billions of people back into poverty in the developing world. That is what she's calling for. But because she is this very telegenic, young, 16-year-old activist, the media love her. People who sit in editorial rooms uh, love her, promote her. They believe the exact same thing. They're all far left environmentalists who hate, fundamentally, who hate capitalism. And so there's a sort of in crowd and they promote themselves. This is complete nonsense. Even time readers who participated in a survey and voted did not choose Greta, did not choose this doom and gloom environmentalism as the person that they thought was the most important, relevant person 2019. So every year, Poll, uh, Time does a poll of its readers. Uh, according to Time themselves, more than 27 million votes were cast in this year's survey, which offers members of the public a chance to vote on who they think had the most impact on the events of this year. So more than 30% of visitors in the 2019 poll selected the Hong Kong protesters who have staged mass demonstrations in the semi-autonomous city since June. The protests initially began in response to a controversial extradition bill, but has since grown into an outright rebellion demanding greater autonomy from China. So 30% of people thought that it should be the Hong Kong protesters who would win this uh, person of the year. As you know, it, is, uh, it, can, it can be a group that wins or it can be an individual. So why time didn't go with the actual people risking their lives, being brave, doing what they can to stand up for freedom and democracy is beyond me. Again, it's because they love this niche uh, climate alarmism issue. And it, time reveals that in their own survey, only 4.5% of readers selected the climate strikers and the protesters who are marching for climate action to, to win. And, and Greta was just one of those individuals. So completely lopsided. For some reason, uh, Time Magazine decides to go with Greta, uh, probably because she is young and blonde and being on the front cover of a magazine will probably uh, prompt more people to pick it up. Uh, personally, I think that there's a lot of more deserving uh, people, whether it be those uh, brave protesters in Hong Kong. Over a thousand protesters in Iran have been killed by the Islamist regime over there. Talk about bravery, talk about courage. Uh, they could have won. I think it would have been fun, personally, if they had given it to Conan, the dog who helped uh, take down uh, the who helped in the raid to take down ISIS leader Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. I would personally give it to Conan the dog, but that's just me. I would probably actually give it to the protesters, even in Iran, either in Iran or Hong Kong. But again, it's 2019, so we reward a celebrity over actual bravery. Uh, next, I want to talk about Jason Kenney, who was in Ottawa this week. He had a meeting with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Tuesday. And Jason Kenney took a very different approach to uh, Premier Scott Moe, who was there three weeks ago from Saskatchewan, meeting with the Prime Minister. It was really interesting to watch. So when Scott Moe met with uh, Trudeau, he was very uh, visibly upset. He was angry. You know, it was closer to the actual election. And obviously, he felt that the Liberals winning a minority government would be bad for his province. He had a couple of major demands that Trudeau basically just laughed at. Like, Trudeau's not going to reverse some of his major uh, positions in the campaign, like getting rid of the carbon tax. Uh, and, and it just didn't go anywhere. So that was one approach. And what you saw was Jason Kenney take a di very different approach. He said that he was uh, optimistic going into the meeting. He was open-minded. He was really there doing diplomacy. He wanted to have conversations and really get the ball rolling. He had a productive meeting, it looked like, with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland, who 
even though she represents a riding of downtown Toronto, she is originally from Alberta, so she's a good person to kind of have an olive branch with. And then uh, Trudeau and Kenny sat down on Tuesday. Again, Kenny was pretty optimistic after here's what Jason Kenny had to say after the meeting. My message to the Prime Minister, he said to Premier Mo three weeks ago, you, you need to come back to me with a consensus amongst the premiers on equalization reform. We've come back with a consensus, which is, uh, is a kind of rebate to the provinces that pay into equalization when they're facing a time of real decline. Now, this is really interesting. So Prime Minister Trudeau is kind of playing a game with these Western premiers. After his meeting with Scott Moe, one of the conditions he said was, look, we will have a serious conversation about equalization if and only when the premiers can have some kind of a agreement, a unanimous consensus on what we should do and how we should change equalization, which is basically a fool's errand. The pre premiers are never going to agree. Quebec and Alberta are never going to sit down and say, OK, let's change the equalization payment one way or another. So because it, right now it benefits Quebec so much and hurts Alberta so much, any change having Quebec to agree with that is just never going to happen. Uh, but then what Jason Kenney did was he had a meeting with all the premiers last week in Mississauga, and they did agree to a minor tweak of that equalization payment so that there would be a clause that would allow uh, provinces that are having a downfall in their natural resources to have a break, so to pay a little bit less. So Jason Kenney was actually successful in reaching some kind of a consensus among the premiers, and he took that back to the prime minister. So just keep in mind, Alberta is really struggling, it's really suffering, not just because of low price of oil, but also because of the lack of pipelines, lack of infrastructure to get any of their resources to a market other than the United States. So Alberta is hurting, and yet in 2019, they're still paying $23 billion more to the federal government than they receive in services. $23 billion more. So what Jason Kenney is in Ottawa asking for this week was just a $2.4 billion rebate, which is just a fraction of that. And I think Justin Trudeau would be wise uh, to listen to them and try to pl play ball with Jason Kenney, just given um, the extraordinary situation that's happening uh, with uh, the lack of unity in this country right now. Okay, moving on. So it is Thursday, December 12th, and that means that there is an election going on in the United Kingdom right now. It's been really interesting to watch. You have uh, Boris Johnson, who is a former mayor of London, and he's just sort of this character. He's got a lot of personality. He's a very smart guy, uh, not always politically correct, kind of like Trump in that way, although I think that he comes from much more of a political establishment background. It was really entertaining to watch his campaign and really show, show us here in Canada, you know, those are our political cousins over there in the UK, sh show us how it's done, how a conservative can run an interesting, effective political campaign. I loved the advertisements in this campaign. I'm going to show one right here. This is probably one of my favorite political ads I've ever seen. Oh, hi. Who is it? It's Carol Singers. Oh. So as you can see, that was a clip from Love Actually, a play off the clip Love Actually, and Boris does a great job just saying, hey, let's just get Brexit done. This is something that's been hanging over society for several years now. The previous Conservative governments haven't been able to get it done. Boris is the guy that needs a majority and he can get it done. So I appreciate that. Uh, here's another clip from the campaign this week. Again, yeah, just a very, you know, amusing, well-run campaign. And you know, Boris Johnson does need a majority. It's going to be close. The latest polls have the Conservatives somewhere around 43 to 45 percent, which would be the threshold. So uh, we will have a report on that later to find out what happened. All right, let's move on. Uh, this is a, from a report over at the Post Millennial. I feel like the social justice warriors have their eyes on the NHL. The NHL is the next victim of the sort of woke mob, the woke left. Uh, we all know they went after Don Cherry pretty hard, uh, but that was just the beginning. So the NHL has released just sort of a wave of measures that are really over the top. It makes it seem like they're trying to copy some of the worst ideas from universities over the last few years as students went further and further towards demanding safe spaces. Uh, that's basically what the NHL is doing, providing safe spaces for 
the players. So Gary Bettman, the NHL commissioner, announced there will now be mandatory counseling and training concerning anti-bullying and anti-racism. Gary Bettman said inclusion and diversity are not simply buzzwords. They are the foundational principles of the NHL. Our message is unequivocal. We will not tolerate abusive behavior of any kind. Okay, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, we don't want to have racism in the NHL. It's one thing to find players and find coaches if they're ever, you know, heard to be saying something that is racist and unacceptable. But some of these measures that the NHL are bringing in, I find to be quite Orwellian. They created an anonymous hotline for players, so kind of like a snitch line, uh, which of course could be open to all kinds of abuse. When you have one side being able to make an anonymous grievance against someone else, uh, and then, you know, not have any accountability, that, that kind of goes against a fundamental principle of Western justice, you, you, namely that you have to face your accuser. And this is a kind of um, rabbit hole that university campuses went down. So you can have an anonymous complaint, which is so open to being abused, because if you just don't like a player on your team, if you just don't like your coach, uh, you have the ability and suddenly the power to really cause damage and cause harm, an accusation like you know, saying someone is racist or saying someone's bullying can really damage your career. And, you know, to have it so that just anonymously someone can make that kind of complaint is really bad precedent. Uh, aside from obviously, you know, the mandatory counseling, which is not proven to have any effectiveness whatsoever. So, Again, this is just kind of sad. I don't know if this is the NHL sort of proactively saying to the woke mob, uh, look, we're doing all the correct things, so don't come after us, or if that leftist ideology has really seeped its way into the NHL and into hockey. But again, when you watch hockey, when you play hockey, you're doing it to escape from politics. You don't want that political identity politics chasing you down into every corner of society. And that is what's happening is that there's no, nothing is safe. Postmillennial describes this as a grievance filled McCarthyist era with blacklists, witch hunts and virtue signaling. It's already begun. Uh, it's sad. It's sad that hockey is going down this path. Okay, it is Thursday, so we have our fake news story of the week. I, I have to admit, this isn't exactly fake news because it's based on something that is real, but it was just so absurd that I had to, I had to read it to you, I had to tell you about it. So this was an exclusive over at the CBC. Transport Canada investigates racist song shared in no fly list office 10 years after the fact. So the gist of the story is that 10 years ago, an individual shared an email with some of his buddies in the office of a parody video. The parody video was a Frank Sinatra song that had been turned into a song talking about a man's anxiety uh, getting on an airplane worrying about terrorism. Strangers on my flight, turbans they're packing, wondering if they might plan a hijacking. And again, it's a parody song. It's satire. It's actually kind of funny. Uh, the song is more poking fun at the individual and his own anxiety with flying in the era of terrorism and 9-11, as opposed to actually, you know, being racist against people who might carry out terrorist attacks. Uh, it's, it's a silly, lighthearted song. So an individual bureaucrat shared this video and it really really irked one of his female employees so for the last 10 years she has been trying to basically get this guy fired it seems like a personal vendetta that she just simply doesn't like this guy uh, here's a quote from the individual civil servant I'm absolutely disgusted she told the CBC News the email contained an extremely racist vitriolic and hate-filled satirical rendition the individual who sent the email and the individuals who covered it up have responsibilities dealing with the public directly. So again, this is really just a case of a very oversensitive bureaucrat who is upset. She said that she saw her 17 year career as a federal public civil servant fall apart as a coworker who shared the song was promoted. It's demoralizing, it's depressing. And in the end, I couldn't stay, she said. Again, I think this is just a case of someone being way too sensitive. And you can kind of imagine why this woman didn't really get ahead in her career. She's so obsessed with the fact that this coworker of hers shared an email that she didn't like, that was not politically correct enough for her, that she basically spent the rest of her career trying to get him fired. Whereas, you know, the guy that sent the email seems like he's just, you know, trying to get along with his colleagues by sharing maybe an amusing, funny, 
video and he's probably a likable person whereas she's probably not and so she was trying to get this this individual fired uh, people were kind of just blowing her off and it wasn't until Amnesty International got involved and took interest in this case that it finally got somewhere and now the department is investigating it. Okay, why on earth Amnesty International is concerned about what kind of videos civil servants in, Canada's, in Canada share and the kind of satirical and parody videos they might find funny is just beyond me. It shows uh, how far Amnesty International has fallen. You know, in some parts of the world, they do good work. They do good work in Iran, places that have actual human rights abuses and actual state, the state cracking down and hurting individuals. In Canada, they obviously have a lot of time in their hands, so they pick up silly, petty little grievances like this one. The CBC story, the reason I include it in the fake news of the week is because the CBC really drums this up like this is some kind of a horrific affront to Canadian democracy and it just shows like some kind of systemic racism. Um, and again, it's just full of over the top quotes and people talking about how crazy and unacceptable it is that an individual back in 2008 or 2007 would share a satirical video with his friends. Okay, let's move on again. It's Thursday, so let's do a quick round of Ask Me Anything. Okay, this one comes from Daryl. My question is, how deep does the dissent go in our party? Campbell, I assume he's talking about Kim Campbell, has been a turncoat for as long as I can recall. Mulroney had questionable business dealings, therefore questionable character. Now he's agreeing with carbon taxes. Do you think people like these two, along with whomever they're aligned with, blew the last election for us, and they're now trying to remove and ruin a good man's reputation? The good thing about the Conservative Party is that it's always been a big tent, so you have a lot of different kind of factions of Conservatives. You have the sort of red Tories who mostly live in and around Toronto, but then you also have so the social conservatives and sort of the prairies, you have libertarians who would want like a very small government, as well as again, more social conservatives who have want their values reflected in their political party and in their leader. I think it's good that we can all get along and stay in the same party. The fear is when you have factions like Maxine Bernier leaving the party or the potential of someone like Peter McKay becoming leader and completely alienating people in Western Canada and that base of sort of blue conservatives on, on the prairies, that's when you risk uh, splitting the party up and never, uh, never having a chance at becoming prime minister. Uh, I, I don't know if people, some of the red Tories would have left the party over Andrew Scheer. I feel like those people might have left the party over Stephen Harper. So I'm not really sure that they're the people that are to blame for the loss in the last election. But I will just say that the conservatives will do a lot better if they can remain one party and remain united. Uh, next question comes from Ron. This is a pretty complicated question. So he says, is there such thing in the Canadian Constitution as the Alberta Act? I was told at a recent meeting that there was a clause in the Constitution called the Alberta Act that prevented Alberta from ever having as many elected representatives as Quebec in the House of Commons. I've not been able to prove or disprove this allegation, so I was hoping someone with a bit more resources than myself would be able to. So the, the, the short answer is, well, yes, there is such thing as the Alberta Act. It came into effect in 1905, and that was just the act that brought Alberta into the Confederation. It was an act of Parliament that created the province of Alberta, and notably, it allowed the government of Canada at the time to maintain control of Alberta's natural resources and public lands. Uh, that was the case at the time. And as far as representation, there is mention of Quebec in the Alberta Act, but it, it's only as far as how the formula is drawn up to determine how many seats Alberta will have in the House of Commons. So back then, Quebec was guaranteed 65 seats that came into effect with the Constitution Act in 1867. Quebec was always going to have 65 seats. And then the other provinces, as they joined, they would have as many seats proportionate to their population as Quebec did to, uh, to, had to 65 seats. Then in 1974, there was a new act that was introduced. It was called the Representation Act of 1974. That upped Quebec's allocation of seats to 75, but then the same formula took effect. So the answer is no, there is nothing in the Constitution that prevents uh, Alberta from having more seats than Quebec, but Alberta would have to have a bigger population. And the formula for how seats are drawn up are based on Quebec having a certain number of seats. I think what you might be thinking of is in the Senate, because the Senate is different. It is given, seats are given out on a regional basis, not based on representation by population. So based on 
Uh, the Constitution, Quebec will always have 24 seats in the Senate, so will Ontario, and then the other two regions, so one being Western Canada and the Western provinces, and the other, the Maritimes, also get 24 seats, but then there are extra seats allocated. So Newfoundland and Labrador get six seats, and then each of the prairies get one seat. So really, the Maritimes have 30 seats, even though the population is quite small, whereas Western Canada, with bigger population, only has 24 seats. So. In the Senate, it's not very even. In the House of Commons, at least, they try to be a little bit more even. All right, guys, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you want to have one of your questions answered and ask me anything, don't forget to sign up for one of our clubs. You can do that over at tnc.news. All right, thank you so much and have a great weekend.